Thank you much for that lovely introduction. So this is really geared towards the families. Uh, that is my primary focus in conveying some of this information. Um, just to start, I don't have any relevant disclosures uh, for this talk. Uh, so what am I trying to get across in the next half hour? What is an epilepsy syndrome? Just start with the basics. What are these terms we use, genotype, phenotype, correlation? I'll define that for you a little bit. How does somebody look versus what are their genes? And why do we care about epilepsy syndromes? Why does it matter at all? How do we as an epilepsy community think about epilepsy syndromes and organize them? And then what are some of the epilepsy syndromes that sort of are in the area of Dravet, related, close to, confused sometimes with Dravet. How do we distinguish them, and, and, uh, and where does that leave us? So I wanted to provide a resource up front uh, for this. If you're looking to educate yourself more about epilepsy syndromes, uh, the International League Against Epilepsy has a very good website where they have descriptions of various different features of different syndromes, and, and you can read through that. It's publicly available. So what is an epilepsy syndrome? Well, a syndrome in medicine is essentially just a constellation of symptoms. It's a collection of certain traits, certain features that a patient may have. When we think about that in the context of epilepsy, we're usually talking about what types of seizures does an individual have? When did they start? What are other aspects of their neurologic condition like? What's their development? What does their EEG look like? And does that have any clues that are specific to a particular syndrome? And then this large group of things that we as epileptologists boil down to comorbidities. And that's like everything else neurologic that's not your seizures, um, which obviously is really important and actually can be a lot of different things. We boil all of that down and say, this is your electroclinical syndrome or electroclinical features. And that just means electro for EEG. What are your EEG features like in clinical? All the things that you tell your doctor about when you go into the clinic. The other thing that's equivalent to that electroclinical feature is phenotype. Phenotype is just the science word for what does a person look like? What are their features? What is that constellation of symptoms? So this is sort of a theoretical idea. And what I have here at the top is developmental tra trajectory. This could really be anything. It could be developmental trajectory. It could be your epilepsy trajectory. It could be sleep issues trajectory, whatever that component of the disease might be. But in this case, the black line represents normal development of a child. And then you have blue lines and red lines. The red lines are patients that started off on a normal developmental trajectory, and then at some point, that veered off course. And that could have actually gone backwards for a period of time, and then maybe it plateaued, maybe it went backwards and then caught up, maybe it just didn't quite keep up anymore. The blue lines are kids that never quite had normal development. They were always sort of a little bit behind, and again, you could have multiple different ways that that could present. All of these things can be encompassed in what does a phenotype look like? What does a syndrome look like? These are what we call longitudinal aspects of a disease that are really important. The other term you hear is n the natural history of the disease. And that's actually something that's really important. And we are trying to define much better in multiple different genetic epilepsies um, over the last several years and going forward. So how distinct is one epilepsy syndrome for another? Um, they're completely concretely distinct, uh, I promise. We would love to think of it that way, and we want to say, you belong in that bin, and you belong in that bin, and that's all there is to it. But the reality is it's really complicated. It's not totally cut and dry. Uh, and many epilepsy syndromes have overlapping features. And so then when you decide, oh, you fit into this syndrome or that syndrome, you're, you're really deciding which of those features you have more of or which ones you to think as a practitioner is more important. And as an example of that, so where's that patient fit? What syndrome does the patient represented by the star have? They've got certain features that fit in A and certain features that fit in B. All of their features fit within C, so is it C? 
Maybe. Maybe that makes the most sense. Just as a theoretical idea on kind of how we think about this. So what about syndromes defined by a gene? Over the last 10 years, we've discovered more and more genes that cause epilepsy. We have started to play with this idea of can we define an epilepsy by its gene? And there's certain genes that have been discovered that didn't have an epilepsy syndrome already defined to fit it. And those have tended to start to be known by their gene. And so you'll hear gene name, blah, 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 epilepsy syndrome, or related epilepsy. Um, and I listed a couple examples here, like CDKL5 deficiency disorder or CDKL5 related epilepsy um, would be one that you could think about. So is the gene and the epilepsy syndrome the same thing? I don't think I have an answer for that, and I don't think actually anybody has a perfect answer on that. I think it's something we're still struggling with as a community. Is SCN1A the same as Dravet syndrome? Maybe, maybe not. And I think there's reasonable arguments on both sides of that. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we look at genes at, when we come to the end as well. But I think at the end of the day, even if we say it's the gene, it maybe doesn't mean that that gives us more information than an epilepsy syndrome does. And it doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't limitations of using that definition. So this gets into the issue of what we call genotype phenotype correlation. How does the gene change present in a patient or a group of patients explain the way that that patient looks? So why do we care about this at all? Why do epilepsy syndromes matter? Essentially, it comes down to historically, meaning going back 50, 60 years, if you could come up with certain clusters of symptoms that were common to a whole group of patients, that could tell you something about what might happen to that patient in the future, their prognosis, what might be the best treatment for them, what might be harmful for them. And it may tell you a little bit about what you should look for as an explanation for it. Because an epilepsy syndrome is not the same as an etiology. The etiology is the cause. That might be a genetic cause. That might be something acquired. Maybe you had a stroke or something like that. So the etiology could, is different than what the syndrome is. The syndrome is the description of the constellation of features that you have. So this is an example just to show how powerful this could be. If you had a newborn baby, started having frequent seizures, you do an EEG, and you see either the one on your right or the one on your left. The one on the left is basically a normal EEG. The one on the right is a very abnormal EEG with a specific pattern that epileptologists in the room would recognize. And we can say that the baby on the left has a good chance of having the seizure stop, have normal development, and going on and having a relatively normal life with this bump in the road early on. The one on the right is going to have a very different future with constant issues throughout their life in terms of development, lifelong epilepsy, and, and numerous other issues. And so that's a really powerful way that we can figure out what's going on with that particular patient and have some way of preparing that family for what's going to happen and probably has treatment implications also. So how do we as epileptologists organize all of these different epilepsy syndromes in order to see how they relate to each other and maybe to help us as we're meeting a patient think about what, what fits this patient, which group or specific epilepsy syndrome should I be thinking about? And I think some of the ways we think about it is based on the age of onset. There's certain things that are pediatric epilepsy syndromes, certain things that aren't. There's certain ones that happen in infancy or early childhood or in your teenage years. A basic tenet of epilepsy is, is it generalized or is it focal or both or unknown? gets a little bit fuzzy sometimes, but we like to try to think of it as generalized, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, or focal. Focal is one place. Generalized, it comes from the whole brain at the same time. And then we can start to break it down by etiology, and I've alluded to that a little bit with the genetic side of things, but it could also be a variety of other genetic or, or uh, other etiologies that might be explaining 
what is causing the seizures for that particular patient. And I listed a couple of different options for things we think about. So this is kind of a complicated slide, and the point isn't to get all of this, and the epilepsy docs in the room will recognize this, and, it, and some of them might agree with it, and some of them might not, but this is the latest way of thinking about this proposed by the International League Against Epilepsy. And it's designed to allow you to be able to incorporate those things that we do know about that patient but accept the fact that we maybe don't have all the information on any one patient to be able to fit them into a perfect epilepsy syndrome. So you start with what are their seizure types at the very top, and they may have a variety of types of seizures. They may have only one type of seizure. Do those tend to fall into focal or generalized? Again, I'll explain it in a minute. Is it not clear? I don't know whether that's focal or generalized. And then you move from seizure type, which is any one event, to epilepsy type. Is the epilepsy overall, generalized appearing, focal appearing, or a combination of the two where I'm still not sure? That gives you some information about the syndrome. Prior to that, we hadn't really talked about other aspects of their neurologic condition, right? What's their development like? What other comorbidities do they have? That all gets pulled in when you move to a specific epilepsy syndrome. And you may or may not be able to actually put them into a specific bin. In some cases, you can. In some cases, you can't. But running next to this the whole time, you're thinking about what is the underlying cause. That's etiology on the right. And what are the other issues that this patient might be dealing with? So this isn't necessarily a perfect system, but this is um, a way that we're trying to be a little bit more flexible to say when we have a good specific epilepsy syndrome that fits you perfectly, great, we have that and this is what it is. But when we don't, we may have other levels of information that we can use to give us some guidance about where things are going or what general category a patient might fit into. So if we're talking about Dravet syndrome, we'd probably be talking about something like this. We're in the genetic category as far as etiology. We're thinking about something that's a combined, generalized, and focal in many cases, though maybe not all cases. It may be just one or the other for some patients. So this whole generalized focal thing. I'm showing an EEG. You don't have to be able to read an EEG. All the squiggly lines represent one part of the brain. We put a bunch of electrodes all over the head, and so you get a bunch of squiggly lines. Well, you can see on the one on the left, there's this abrupt change on all of the different lines. We call those spikes, and there's spikes in every line in the head. So the whole head is seeing this epileptic activity at the same time. The one on the right, you can see some of them, if my mouse is showing up, I'm not sure if it will. No, it doesn't look like it. The ones at the top, you don't really see as much change, but you see these spiky things happening in the lower ones. That's a focal seizure. It's just saying that it's starting in one part of the brain. Now that can spread and spread to other parts of the brain as well. So then we take that kind of information, what we see on EEG, the description that we get from families, and we say a seizure type, not an epilepsy type, but a seizure type is either generalized or focal. And I've listed a couple of the different types of seizures that might fall into one bin or the other. So you could have myoclonic seizures. Of course, that's a sharp jerk. Atonic, that's falling or losing tone, usually very abruptly. Absence, being a staring spell, usually fairly short, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, but sometimes longer. And tonic-clonic, that's your typical, what everybody thinks about in the movies as a generalized tonic-clonic seizure, right? Focal seizures, you can have any number of symptoms. It all depends where does it start, what part of the brain is involved, and what part of the brain is then being disrupted by that seizure. Of course, a focal seizure can spread to the whole brain and then look like a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. What kind of comorbidities are we talking about when we're thinking about uh, an epilepsy syndrome or about epilepsy in general? Uh, again, it's really, this is a short list, but it's really everything that your brain does that isn't the seizures, right? And so. Um, if you can come up with something, it falls into the comorbidity category. 
intellectual disability or developmental problems, behavioral changes, motor function, language function, sleep, um, all of that falls into the category of comorbidities. So what types of syndromes are kind of like Dravet syndrome, might get confused for Dravet syndrome. This is a short list of probably some of the more common things that an epileptologist might think about. And it illustrates a little bit of a point. So the top two are probably the most common, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome and Du syndrome. Du syndrome has a bunch of different names over time, um, but which we don't have to get into. Progressive myoclonus epilepsy and benign myoclonic epilepsy of infancy. And some of these are a little bit old names, but that's OK. So these two are probably the most common ones that might get confused with Dravet syndrome. Why is that? So all four of these syndromes have the potential to have onset of epilepsy less than three years of age, myoclonic, those sharp jerk seizures, drop seizures where you fall, generalized tonic-clonic seizures, febrile seizures, and you can see there's kind of some overlap with Dravet syndrome, which could have any of those as well. They might have other things for sure. They may not have all of those things, but all of those things can be present in any of these syndromes. So how are they different? These are a couple of examples just to let you know how we might think about distinguishing features. And if you get 10 epileptologists in a room to discuss this, we'll come up with 15 answers. But you know, these are some typical things you might think about. So LGS and DUES, they usually start a little bit later than Dravet syndrome. They may have some specific unique EEG findings that would point to them. And a little bit less often, you'll have focal features, though in many of them, you can have focal features early on and that may uh, reduce over time. Benign myoclonic epilepsy of infancy, typically their development is pretty normal and stays pretty normal, and eventually the seizures stop. Progressive myoclonus epilepsy is usually associated with loss of developmental milestones. So you go backwards, you regress, and you continue to do that, and this is actually a fatal condition. But you could see that particularly at the beginning of each of these, before you know what's happening or where a child's going, they may actually be kind of hard to distinguish. What else is different? Those really shouldn't have an SCN1A mutation. And some people come, might come argue with me about that. But even for some that have been reported to have SCN1A mutations, there's a little bit of question about that in, uh, in the literature. And so that brings us back to that idea. Should we really be defining things based on the gene rather than based on these clinical features? Should we be talking about the genetics? Maybe, but the reality is that different patients have different features. They don't always fit into a classic epilepsy syndrome, the way that we have described a patient for sometimes decades. And so that makes it hard just to define them by their features. Well, if we define them by their gene, That'll be cleaner. But now you have patients who have the exact same change in the exact same gene, and they look very different. They have different features. They have different symptoms, different problems. They may all have epilepsy. They may all have certain features in common, but they have lots of things that are different about them. So that doesn't really solve all the problems. I think there is some movement to go that direction in terms of being able to think about how we treat some of these disorders. And so if you have an SCN1A mutation and we have a drug that we think can fix the SCN1A problem, then I want to only deal with patients that have SCN1A. And so then you start to think about clinical trials and this idea of precision medicine where you might want to define patients by a gene change rather than thinking about the cluster of symptoms that they have. Because whether you have this cluster of symptoms or these cluster of symptoms, at the end of the day, we think it is related to you having some gene problem. And if we're targeting that gene, then it should help either way. And so that's, uh, I think, one of the trends that we're starting to see where the gene definition is very useful. So 
uh, to sort of sum up, epilepsy syndromes are a cluster of certain traits. Genes are starting to be used to define epilepsy syndromes, but we're still sorting that out. We don't always have genes for all the conditions. Neither is a perfect system because either way you can have overlapping symptoms, things that are confusing, patients that don't fit perfectly. Either of these systems are better than nothing, and in some places, one's going to be more useful than another one. These are my kids at the zoo, and I'm happy to take questions, which I think we're doing at the end. Thanks.